Welcome to A Window on Samri, where we take you inside South Australia's independent not-for-profit health and medical research institute. Each episode, we get to know the people driving our life-changing research, getting into what motivates them personally and how their work is delivering a brighter, healthier future for all. Hannah, where does your curiosity come from? Hmm, that's a good question. Maybe being an only child, I kind of had to... uh entertain myself quite a lot when I was a child as well yeah yep so throwing the ball against the wall yes exactly (laughs) you've got to make fun somehow and so I think I just naturally found joy in figuring out what was happening around me and you say you get bored easily what's it like inside your head yeah pretty chaotic um it's it's always running my brain is always going not necessarily always about work but always thinking about something um so yeah pretty chaotic inside this little head, but it switches off relatively easily when it needs to. So what do you do with that day to day? Do you have any techniques for when it's time to switch off? Not necessarily techniques. I did learn this technique last year, which is the five, four, three, two, one of anxiety. I don't think I have anxiety. I think I'm a little highly strung perhaps. (laughs) And you have to think about five things that you can hear, four things that you can feel, three things that you can see i honestly i usually fall asleep before three okay um so it works quite well but no i think i've just learned to create and set quite strong boundaries around work life fun relaxation has it always been that way or is that something that you've been able to to develop no i think it's always been that way actually i think when i was younger i played a lot of sport did a lot of other activities went to school, went to uni. And so I was kind of forced to switch quickly between different activities. And I think that that sort of fed through to my life now. And how has your desire to find answers shaped your life so far? Mm, I think it's definitely what brought me into science. I was always quite interested, always been interested in health and medical research and, and that topic generally. I think for a long time, I struggled with whether I wanted to do medicine or not. And I think I ultimately never committed to it because for me, it maybe lacked the curiosity element a little bit. I liked the idea of the unknown and sort of chartering the unknown a little bit more and, and generating the new knowledge that would hopefully influence and impact clinical care. So I think that that's probably what brought me down the medical sciences path and, and what really resulted in me wanting to find answers all the time. So the idea of a new frontier and being mm. able to make discoveries. Yeah, definitely. And particularly with, with my research area being supportive cancer care, it's kind of a not invisible area. It's certainly improving and increasing in its visibility, but it is um, an untouched area in some respects. And so I like the challenge of kind of advocating for this, this under-recognised area of research. What is it about being a scientist that satisfies that part of your nature, the curiosity? I think the fact that you can identify a problem, set out a set of experiments or plans or approaches to to address that problem or better understand that problem and then kind of address it in, in these iterative steps, hopefully not too small of an iterative step, but uh, in these iterative steps, I, I'm quite pedantic around organisation and things like that. So I like that you can see this problem, identify how you're going to understand it and how you're then going to apply that knowledge. And how much has the reality met the expectation since you've got into your career and started working? Yeah, I think one of the challenges in science is that we're always expected to produce these groundbreaking findings, these, you know. It's probably the media's fault. Yeah, yes, it's all your fault. (laughs) (laughs) You know, and and you, people are always like, oh, what did you find? What Mm. have you discovered recently? And and I think the, the community's expectation is that scientists on a daily basis are discovering new things but the reality is is that that simply isn't possible and is not the case and I think I probably fall you know or at least fell into that trap a little bit I thought that I would generate more quote unquote exciting discoveries and findings a little more readily and faster than than what I do in reality and that you know I could just say well I want to do a clinical trial in this and I'm going to go and do it and and kind of grappling with the practicalities of actually executing that is is sometimes a little bit troubling and and reconciling that idealistic 
perspective of science versus what's truly possible was a little bit challenging, but I think it's not something that's a barrier. It's just adapting your expectations around what's really possible. Because it's a real slow burn. It's a slow burn. It's a slow burn. Everything takes so much longer than you ever anticipate. And I'm still learning about how long things take. You know, I write a grant and I write a timeline and I think it's totally reasonable and I get to doing it and it's, and it's just not. So I think I'm still learning around how to appropriately work towards these milestones, what's realistic in terms of my expectations and, and capabilities. And, and on one that. hand, it's so frustrating, I imagine, and takes up so much time. But on the other hand, it's just constantly fascinating because you're forced to grow and develop. And even when you think you've learned from the last time and now you've got it perfect, it humbles you. Yeah, absolutely. Being a scientist is extremely humbling. But I think the other thing that, um, that helps you not get too kind of down about it is the fact that every scientist faces it. You know, you think that sometimes you're facing these challenges in these barriers and hurdles alone, and then you go and talk to someone and they're facing the exact same thing. So I think that that's a nice reminder to, to, don't, to, to not get too insular in your approach to working towards a problem you're trying to solve. It's about, you know, making sure you connect with the community around you of scientists so that you can learn from potentially their mistakes um, and, and also feel like you're doing you're doing okay. And that's part of why it's great working at Samri because yes. there's other scientists everywhere so <laughs> yeah. you can share in your pain. Yes, exactly. But also in the success as exactly. well. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, exactly. I think one of the key you know, mottos or, or f- things I try to do in my group is, is make an effort to celebrate every win, no matter how big or small. I think it's really important to take the time to recognize when you have had something works mm. an, an experiment generate the results you were anticipating you know funding awards anything like that we make a big effort to celebrate because realistically the big goal you might be working towards them might be 20 years 30 years in yeah. the future so you're going to have to celebrate those little wins along yeah. the way to keep yourself motivated Definitely. because no one can just hold off for decades <laughs> until they're allowed to feel happy about the work they're doing yes exactly yeah what yeah. drew you to cancer research I think, you know, every, maybe not everyone, but a lot of people in medical science are naturally drawn to cancer research. I think it's a field that, you know, simply because of statistics tends to have had an impact on, on most people in the community. So I think naturally everyone has some degree of personal experience that is going to potentially drive them to that area of research. I guess the reason I I ended up transitioning more into supportive cancer care, which is the field that really addresses the symptoms and side effects of cancer therapy with the goal of of improving and promoting the health and well-being of people affected by cancer. That really came from an undergraduate project that I did. I, I was working on a project with my supervisor at the time, Rachel Gibson, which was looking at how chemotherapeutic drugs damage the lining of the gut. And it suddenly made me realize that this was a really unique area because it drew together parts of my interest in gastrointestinal physiology and immunology, which I really enjoyed, microbiology, which I really enjoyed, but had a nice application to cancer. So it kind of ticked a lot of boxes for me. And, and as I mentioned before, I was particularly drawn by the challenge of advocating for this underappreciated area of research and really working to improve the visibility of this area. Because hmm. I think as a society, we think about the prospect of curing cancer and we know when people go into remission, but we don't naturally think much about caring for people once they finish treatment or, or they're still living with cancer, but trying to make that more palatable and a, a better experience. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Unfortunately, the side effects are, are seen as this necessary evil that people just have to put up with in order to be cured or to, to have a good response to therapy. And, and so I'm yeah really motivated by challenging that notion and actually saying, well, I think we can achieve both. I think we can help people achieve the best possible outcome. And that best possible outcome is not just survival, but it, it's it's surviving well. It's being able to still have social interactions physical abilities, be able to go to school, go to work, all of those types of things that make someone's life fulfilling. And unfortunately, cancer therapy has a tendency to strip many of those things away. What's the personal experience you've had that's reinforced the importance of the work you do? 
Yeah, so I had a close friend of mine last year who unfortunately passed away from bowel cancer. He was only 32, so he was very young. And because of the stage of his disease and, and his age and his fitness, he was treated quite aggressively and he experienced so many side effects during his treatment. And, you know, they, they really forced, all those side effects really forced him to consider what his future was going to look like in terms of treatment decisions. And so I think seeing someone, you know, make huge decisions about wanting to continue on potentially life-saving therapy because of the intensity of these side effects really reinforced to me how important it is that we find ways to alleviate or prevent these side effects from occurring because they're so impactful for people. You know, he was really struggling with fatigue and things like that. So his, his daily enjoyment was, was gone and, and he had no other option other than to, to think about changing his treatment. And, and that's a huge decision for, for someone. And so I think that that was a nice reminder to me for, for how important this work is. What was it like for you to see a friend of yours struggle like that with something that you're so deeply invested in? Yeah, it was kind of motivating, really, I think. Um, obviously, it was extremely sad, but yeah, ultimately motivating and, and a really, yeah, like I said, a, a stark reminder as to how important this, this work is. And, and I've, had, I've had this experience with other people who are not necessarily friends, but, you know, people with lived experiences that I've connected with through various advocacy groups. And, and I'm always met with the same response. People are like, what? You're researching side effects? You care about the side effects? I just thought no one cared about those. Oh my gosh, you know, thank you for, for researching these areas because it's so impactful. But I always assumed it was just something that was part of the cancer journey. So I think having those, those interactions is really important to, to remind me just how valuable people with cancer or how much value they place in this area of research. I think being able to put faces to what you're working on must be really powerful because there could be a tendency to forget about that. If you're mm -hmm. spending most of your time in the lab or at your laptop looking at samples, it doesn't quite have the impact of seeing someone who's actually in that position and that you have the, the potential to be able to help them. It's a remarkable thing <laughs> yeah. and horrible to feel that pain. And I'm sorry you lost your friend, but I understand how that would be inspiring mm. because you think, wow, I could be part of making other people in the future not have to have as much of an awful experience when they're already going through one of the hardest things that someone can go through. Yeah, absolutely. And we see that as well in terms of we, we're running a, a essentially a biobanking study at the moment where we collect stool samples and saliva samples from people going through chemotherapy and they complete a couple of surveys about the symptoms and side effects that they're experiencing. And obviously, you know, these people through participating in this study are receiving no direct benefit. You know, you can appreciate someone's motivation to participate in a clinical trial when there's the possibility that they may be able to access a new therapy that they couldn't have otherwise accessed. But in this study that they are not benefiting in, in any way, shape or form, but the, the, the generosity and the altruism in the people participating is phenomenal. People just want to make their experience impactful and worthwhile. And, and, you know, essentially all of them say, I'm more than happy to participate because I hope my experience generates new knowledge that can prevent this from happening in the future. So it's pretty amazing that people are so generous in that respect. I think there's something about enduring that level of pain where a lot of people feel like they want to be able to create some sort of a silver lining for mm. it if it's not for them, for someone else, because of the depth of feeling involved in how horrible that is. Yeah. And certainly something that's very admirable, mm, but it absolutely. seems to be part of human nature for yeah. a lot of people. It does. Yeah. Yep. How have your public speaking skills benefited your career? I like that you say public speaking skills because if you'd known me maybe 10 years ago, I definitely would not have been recognised for public speaking at all. I was horrendously shy as a child and, and pretty awkward as a teenager and the idea of speaking in front of anyone was mortifying, like horrendously mortifying. I... <laughs> I 
did year 12 Italian and we had an oral exam and I walked in and I burst into tears and walked out and failed because I was just too scared to speak in front of the panel. So yeah, public speaking is not something that is natural to me, but it's something I've worked very hard on over the last, yeah, sort of five to 10 years um, because I recognised it was so important in, in being able to communicate my science to a variety of people. I needed to be able to communicate properly. And so I threw myself into many awkward, horrible, scary situations to, to build up my confidence in public speaking. But I think it's such an important skill to have um, and probably the most important skill to have in science. How are you able to move past that mental barrier? I think firstly just throwing myself into uncomfortable situations and realising that it wasn't as scary as I thought. But I think probably more importantly the thing that helped me was actually when I transitioned from talking about things in undergrad or in high school that I didn't really know anything about to talking about something where I was probably the most knowledgeable person in the room. And I think that that difference is huge. When you're confident in what you're talking about, you're not scared about making a mistake. And even if you make a mistake, you just go with it and laugh it off and it's all fine. So I think, yeah, talking about things that I'm confident in, where I know that I can answer questions and also kind of finding that comfort in not knowing all the answers, saying, yeah, great question. I don't know. Let's reconnect and figure that out together later. I think just all comes with experience. And, and that has certainly been a turning point for me in, in my public speaking. One of the things about public speaking is being more casual and admitting mm. that you're not perfect and yeah. making it feel like a conversation actually makes for great public speaking. Agreed. But it sounds like once you got the motivation and you had enough of a reason to go and be a great public speaker because you saw it as a necessity, that that's when you were able to go out and execute because you weren't doing your Italian presentation, yeah. <laughs> you were doing something. But you had to believe that, yeah, I actually do know a lot about this. Yeah, and, and that confidence to, to work and speak off the cuff. You know, I, I used to practice my presentations down to every single word. I would memorise every word of a 10, 15, 20 minute presentation, which is just not feasible really. Like when you've got the time to do it, fabulous, but I don't anymore. And so I don't practice my presentations really at all anymore because I've got slides that I know will guide me through what I'm saying. And I feel confident enough to, to just speak to the issue or speak to the, the slide in, yeah, like you say, a very conversational way. And I think, you know, from seeing heaps of presentations now at various conferences and other events, it's the conversational, lighthearted, casual presenters that, you know, you want to hear more from. It's not the stilted, scripted, mm. monotone, boring presentations <laughs> that you want to hear. And what doors has that opened up for you? I think certainly it's it has given me many opportunities on a on a global scale to present at meetings. I think I, I've started to to get a reputation as someone that that can present well on topics, and so I think that's certainly resulted in invitations for invited presentations at various events, which has been great. So that's obviously had a, a, a good influence on my reputation as a scientist and my sort of output and collaborations you know you see presentations by by good people you naturally want to go and talk to them so i think it's led to yeah more partnerships and collaborations with people across the world uh it's resulted in more media opportunities and sort of community outreach event opportunities um which has been really great because i think again circling back to that concept of putting a face to the problem. Mm -hmm. I've been able to put myself into the community, hear people's stories and use those stories to really inform the priorities of my group as well. So yeah, I think it's just embedded me more into the global community on many different levels. I think it's really important for young scientists to hear because I think many might think, well, I'm a scientist, so I don't have to worry about presenting. I'm not going to be an actor or mm. in that space. So that doesn't really matter for me. But when it comes to the reality, presenting and being able to speak and being able to make people understand the work you're doing in a way that's concise and mm. makes sense is a huge part of being able to win the support to do the work that you do. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of this like whatever the opposite is to vicious circle, positive <laughs> circle, positive feedback loop. Mm. Yeah, it certainly you know, it gives you that confidence to go and talk to that person at that conference that then ends up in a co-authored publication that then results in a grant together. You know, it's those 
conversations that are so mm. critical. And I think also my public speaking or my approach to public speaking has also influenced my written communication. You know, I think now my, particularly in grants, I have adopted a more conversational style to my writing and I hope that reviewers find it a little easier to read when they're reading, you know, 20, 30 grants at a time that they have this quite natural narrative to them. I don't try to put too much jargon and complexity yeah, into them. It just becomes your voice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I think that's great for people to hear as well because you didn't start out that way. But no. you managed to get there anyway. So <laughs> yes. there's, there's still hope. Yes. Uh, and speaking of young scientists, you've established your own independent research group. What inspires you about being a leader? Yeah, I think I've always naturally gravitated to leadership roles. I I like that opportunity to to be a voice on behalf of a group or or to to help bring together a cohesive teams. Um, so you know, even going back to my sporting life as a teenager, I think you know I always wanted to be the point guard bossing everyone <laughs> running <around>. the show <laughs> yeah. or the captain <laughs> yeah yeah so it's definitely just a, a, a you don't inherent... like being told what to do yeah 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 exactly <laughs> <laughs> um but I also think I like I, I like to be able to the, to be the person that sets the tone for the group in in hopefully what I what I hope is a really positive way so like I was saying before you know creating an environment um of mentorship of, and and celebrating the small wins you know passing up opportunities for me to be able to give them to to younger members of my team. You know, I was afforded opportunities like that by my supervisors. So I guess I'm really excited by the opportunity of of creating an environment where I'm hopefully allowing the younger members of my team to flourish. But yeah, I, I don't, it's weird. I don't think I necessarily always went, yes, I'm going to do a PhD and I'm going to do a postdoc and then I'm going to establish my own group. There wasn't an, an element of sort of organicness that that underpinned that, but I think it probably was always going to happen at some, in some way, shape, or form. And I imagine some people helped you along the way. You're still very young in your career, but ten years ago there were people who would have been doing that for you. And it's there's a certain altruism to be able yeah. to do that for others. Yeah, and I think you know, coming from a, a very female dominant group as part of my PhD was really important for me. I had some really good, strong female role models around me. My my two supervisors, Joe Bowen and, and Rachel Gibson were both fabulous. Um, and Dorothy Keefe was was a big member of our group back then as well before she rose to the top of Cancer Australia. And these were women who were supportive of each other. You know, sometimes you see this tendency in in professional women to kind of cut each other down. Mm. But that absolutely wasn't the case. It was this environment of of supporting each other, and and yeah, really passing up opportunities to to give them to the next generation. And so, it's something that I've definitely, I think at the time I took for granted. I think that I thought it was just normal. But I think as you get a little bit older, you realise that not not every group or person operates like that. So looking back, I feel very privileged to be trained in that in that environment, and I hope it's something that I can give to my students. Yeah. Cool. Which of your achievements have you been most satisfied by so far? Mm, that's a great question. I know there's so many. <laughs> um, I think starting my own group was was a really proud moment for me because it was something that I did, you know, in some part of my mind I always wanted to do, but I didn't really know if I would ever really get there because, you know, there's not like a blueprint of how to start your own group. You just sort of get the grant and and <laughs> give it a shot, but that's grown really nicely over the last few years. And I, I feel like I've got some stability in the team now, which is great. And some, some great capabil like capable students, um, some really great staff who are all so supportive and critical to my productivity and general <laughs> functioning. So, so that's great. But I think aside from that, one of the, the most personally validating experiences I've had has certainly been translocating. I was going to say translocating because I say that all the time about bacteria, relocating overseas. So getting um, my fellowship, the CJ Martin, to to go over to the Netherlands for a couple of years was professionally and personally very, very satisfying and a really great experience for me. 
living in the Netherlands was was fantastic. The way of life there is so great. You know, I lived in this university town called Groningen in the north of the Netherlands. It's kind of like Adelaide. You know, people think it's this little country bumpkin town. It's great. It's really vibrant. It's small, so you can just ride your bike everywhere. Everything is so close. It's full of students. The average age is, I think, 27 or something, so it's super young. And I worked in a university hospital there, which was which was fabulous. I loved the model of a university hospital where you've got researchers walking the same corridors as the clinicians. It creates this environment where there is true cross-pollination between clinical problems and, and sort of discovery-based research. It also was critical in giving me the confidence to come back and start my own group, I think, because I worked quite independently there. I didn't have the, you know, comforts of, of home, both, you know, in terms of my actual home and, and my laboratory home. So I had to learn everything from scratch, you know, methods, protocols, where everything was. And I think that kind of starting at that base level gave me the confidence to come back to Adelaide and start from scratch. So yeah, that was a great experience. So get yourself overseas if you're a yeah. young scientist. Yes, if possible. I know it's not possible for everyone. Do you think we'll live to see a time with when people who are living uh, beyond cancer are disadvantaged? Oh, the optimist in me wants to say yes, but the realist in me probably thinks maybe not entirely. I think we will certainly start to see improvements and, and major improvements. I think that that will come from both better research and and supportive care options so so medications or approaches that are delivered in parallel to current clinical practice and clinical care for people with cancer i also think it will come from improvements in our models of care so you know 5 10 years ago we weren't really thinking about people living 5 10 20 years after a cancer diagnosis but now we are and we're starting to see these improved survivorship pathways to make sure that people who are coming out the other side of a cancer diagnosis are given the tools and the support that they need to get back to work or whatever it is that they want to achieve. So I think we'll definitely see improvements. Whether we're ever going to see a moment in time where there's you know absolutely no adverse effect of cancer and its treatment, I, I think that that's an unrealistic target to work towards because it's an intense disease. It requires intensive surgery. It requires intensive treatment. And so it's going to be a challenge to make sure that those intense therapies are completely sparing every healthy tissue in the body in a way that doesn't impact their ability to kill the cancer, right? So that's, that's the challenge. That's a challenging paradox in supportive care is, is finding ways to prevent side effects without impacting tumour response. So I think we'll see major improvements though. Good thing you love a challenge. Yes, yes. And I think, you know, on that, it's about minimising the burden of these side effects. So, and, and helping people live productively in, you know, despite these side effects from occurring. Um, so minimising their burden, accelerating their recovery, providing people with the support they need to, to get back to work, things like that. Mm. So it's all about minimising that burden, maybe not entirely abolishing them. And we can get so much better at that, but we've already come a long way. Yes, we have. Yeah. We absolutely have. And you were Australia's top female three-point shooter <laughs> briefly in 2006. Have you still got it? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, not at all, unfortunately. Yeah, that was a short-lived moment. Um, of my my past life, we'll I was, take it though. Yeah, That's absolutely. Cool. We will claim that. We will claim that, and I, I continue to claim that for uh, for a long time. I think, but uh, yeah, that was a fun a fun time in my life where I thought for a while I was going to be a superstar basketball player. And but those injuries, you know, and you know, I I stopped gone growing. Pro. I stopped growing at about fourteen <laughs> years old and didn't get much taller than five foot five. So Sounds like excuses to me. Yeah, 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 yeah. But <laughs> yes, that that moment is gone. The ACL is gone which resulted in 12 months of 17-year-old Hannah discovering a little bit of alcohol oh. and, and life outside of basketball, oh, no. which was a bit of a problem. Oh, gosh. <laughs> uh, so you don't shoot hoops anymore? Uh, only for fun, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, down at the park. Anything else you do for fun these days? Um, I really like gardening. I know that sounds like what a very old person says, 
but I am above 30 these days, so I'm allowed to have. Um, Getting up there. I know, exactly. Very old. I love gardening. Got a little garden, only 300 square meter block, but we've managed to fit a lot of fruit trees and, and veggies and beautiful plants. I, it does help that I have a landscaper partner, so, so he helps a lot. He does the heavy lifting. He does the heavy lifting. Uh-huh. Yep, yep. But I do love gardening and I do love cooking. Yep. Um, Again, kind of an old person hobby, isn't it? Ooh. And you did mention off camera. <laughs> You collect some butterflies too, which is quite interesting. <laughs> yeah, butterflies and insects. I've got a little bit of a obsession with uh, cute, creepy yeah. crawlies. So no cockroaches. No cockroaches, okay. no hairy spiders. I have just a few like, of them in my apartment. <laughs> yes, yeah, so do I, actually. <laughs> no, just beautiful bugs, you know, lovely bright green ones or blue ones and beautiful butterflies. They're just pinned everywhere around my house or blue tacked to the wall. There you go. It's a moment, but wow. they're beautiful. Not going to argue with that. <laughs> it's all in the presentation. Yeah. <laughs> when you look back on your career, what do you want to be able to say? Mm, it's a good question. I think I want to be able to say that that through my research and my advocacy, I've been able to improve the recognition and the visibility of supportive cancer care, and I want to see it routinely integrated into modern cancer medicine. It is an indispensable element of modern cancer medicine that needs to be approached by specialists in the area, multidisciplinary teams providing multidisciplinary care to meet the unique needs of individual patients. And so if my research and advocacy can result in changes in clinical practice to have side effects at the forefront of people's minds um, and strategies to prevent or minimize the burden of these side effects then then i'll be very happy we're lucky to have someone like you championing that so thanks, thank Hannah. you thank you very much if you want to learn more about samri and the researchers working to build a brighter healthier future for you and your family head to samri.org.au